Hello and welcome back to the Astronomicon, the Eternal Crusade show. Today with me I have New York Times best-selling author, Black Library writer, Mr. Graham McNeil, who is also the co-writer on the Eternal Crusade. So welcome to the show. Evening. Glad, glad you could have me on. No, welcome. Um, so finally, um, Warhammer 40k fans are getting almost the game of their dreams in the way of an MMO, um, especially after the disappointment of THQ going under with their last attempt at an MMO. Yeah. Um, so first off, what interested you in the project and how did you get, come about getting involved? Well, for a lot of the, the same reasons that you were just saying there, that, you know, that I've, I've been looking forward to, you know, I'm, first and foremost, I am, am and always have been a, a player of, of 40k and, and video games and just getting to combine the two of them was just too good to you know, one of these opportunities. Think, oh, this is just how could it? How can it not work? And then when THQ's uh, project went under, unfortunately, that was one of these things. You think, ah, oh, are we ever going to get a game that where you can play this in a video game like you want to play it in as you read about it in the books? You know, with you know a thousand space marines in battle and hordes of orcs coming towards you. Uh, so that was that's what really kind of attracted me to. To the game because I, you know, finally I was going to get to combine two of my great loves and actually be part of working on it. Um, as to how I got involved with it, it was uh, the guys at uh, Behavior sent me an email and asked me if I had time to have a chat with them about it on Skype and thrash around some ideas. And you know, they let me they were saying what they wanted to do with the game, and I came up with ideas about how you could do various things that they were asking about. And then from there, it just went on to saying, when are you free? Brilliant. And so we know that the Eternal Crusade is set on the world of Arcona. Yes. Um, and we know that it's quite unique in the sense of it has four factions all in one place at one time. And then on top of that, each faction has four of their almost sub-factions. Yeah, so you've got four face mirroring chapters, four Chaos Legions. So what kind of unique opportunities are there for you and Anthony Reynolds is also the co-writer in terms of storytelling. Like what, because you can't really do that in many of the books because a lot of the books are usually centered around maybe one chapter or one legion. Yeah. And what kind of what kind the of thing with the book, does that present? Yeah, I mean, with the book, you're 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 largely focusing on one narrative. It's one story, and crucially for a novel or a film or whatever other medium other than MMOs, you've got an ending. And if you're not working towards an ending in a, a book, then you just get this <clears throat> enormous shaggy dog story. Whereas in an MMO, you can keep the story open. You know, there doesn't have to be a definitive ending. You, you know, you can have endings within the arc, but you don't need to actually have a full stop and say, right, that's your lot. We're done. We're shutting up shop. And that, that allows you all sorts of narrative opportunities to take stories in different directions or move them in ways you might not expect because you don't actually have to have that definitive full stop at the end of it. Um, but yeah, having having all the different factions there, I mean, we've done similar stuff to that before when we've done the worldwide campaigns. Uh, back in when I was part of the design studio, we you know we ran the Armageddon campaign, the Eye of Terror, those sort of things. And again, just great ways. I mean, that was essentially, that was a sort of tabletop Mm. MMO, so to speak, because it, it got thousands upon thousands of people playing the game, which is exactly what you want. And to a large extent, they helped drive the narrative onwards. I mean, we just, for those certainly, we provided a framework and then let people run with it. And this, you know, the Eternal Crusade, you know, there's, there's definite elements of story in this. We've definitely worked in the background to the planet, the history of it, the layers of, of secrets to it, ways they can be revealed and narrative tricks in terms of how to get that story out to the players without relying on you know say 10 minute cutscenes and so on you know that, that it's the players who drive it the players who unlock the story and finding ways to do that in ways that are interesting interactive and make the players the the, the agents of the story, they're the ones driving it, has been, yeah, it's been really interesting. And outside of the game specifically, we've already had the first short story, which was the yeah, introduction to funny. our corner. Um, will there be more short stories, and will those short stories be more 
Um, will they include other factions as well? So will there be short stories that are based why the Eldar are on our corner, etc., etc.? Yeah, I mean, I, I've certainly I've already written uh, a story for the Eldar. Uh, I'm not sure when that's scheduled to come out at all, but certainly there's there's one written for the Eldar, and part of the 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 talks we're having about ways we can do things, ways we can reveal information, ways we can get people up to speed in the backstory is by doing more of those short stories. Uh, so yeah, I I would be very surprised if that's not uh, an avenue we go down. Uh, certainly one that I would love to go down because. Mm -hmm getting all these different factions and exploring why they're there, what they hope to gain by there, uh, and how they're going to interact with the other factions on the planet. Some of those will be hostile, some maybe not so much. Mm. So, yeah, there's, 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 based on a lot of the stuff Anthony and I did up front, there's certainly loads and loads of scope for more of those short stories, yeah. I mean, we, and with those short stories, we've, we've already met, like, uh, in the first short story, we met uh, Brother Sergeant Caster. Yeah. Um, will short stories in factions have reoccurring characters that become um, almost integral to the overall plot of Arcona? I, I suspect so. Uh, I mean, that's not set in stone, certainly, but certainly from my point of view, from the satisfaction of telling those kind of stories, I, I would, it would be my first port of call to think, right, how can we link these together? Where's the, the, the threads that pass between these stories? Because, you know, you've got that the idea that something that we bring to the Horus Heresy novels is that there's got to be a level of connective tissue between them all because otherwise they're just they're happening in isolation. They they just they could be might as well be anywhere yeah. for all that matters. So, you know, when you have start to have those levels of repercussion from one story to the next, it begin it gives it a much greater feel of a living, breathing universe where events have consequences and things don't happen in isolation. Some things happen in one story that means maybe nothing in that story really or something quite small but actually has a, a massive repercussion somewhere further down the line mm. I mean what we've, we touched on it before we're saying like you know there's unique opportunities that you don't get in other, in other mediums but what are the unique challenges as a writer I mean what in, instead, instead of from writing a book just, put, just for a book um, yeah what are the unique challenges you face writing for an interactive medium where it's all about the players? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the biggest challenges is that, you know, you, you are not the god of the story. Mm. You know, you are not the one driving it forward. You are not necessarily the one who's going to pick the choice that you want to be picked. Uh, and having alternatives or plot arcs that you can follow legitimately, even if they're not maybe the ones that you think, you think, right, that's what I, if I was writing a novel, I would write it this way. Mm. But in fact, the players have played it and they've gone this way. So it's that, uh, the idea of branching storylines where you can still maintain the plot and still maintain the forward momentum of it, but then, you know, you've not chosen where it's gone. So that's keeping all your options open and all the possibilities that there might be for where the story could go in ways you hadn't expected. It. So, because, you know, when I'm, you know, when I'm writing a novel, for example, I, I like to keep a, a structure in place that is rigid enough to support the story and give me a good structure to know that, yeah, this is where it's going, it works, and it, here's how it gets me to the end. Whereas, but it's also going to have enough flex in it that if better ideas occur along the way or ideas that I hadn't thought of at the beginning occur, then there's room to include them. I think with the challenge for doing something like Eternal Crusade, or any MMO for that matter, is almost having it the other way around. You know, your structure has to be very, very loose, and it's it's all about the adaptability, all about the, the flex in the story, and the ways you can react you know, instantly, but very, very quickly to changing circumstances of the, the, you know, the narrative playing field. So I talked to Twitter earlier to get some questions from the community, and mm. um, the first one is that they want to know if if the Eternal Crusade proves to be a really big hit, um, not just in gamers, but in the more Warhammer 40k community. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, in your opinion, that on top of short stories, that if it is a big hit, would it get a fully fledged, fleshed out novel? Uh, well, given the past history of uh, Black Libraries Association 
with the computer games. I think it'd be very surprising if it didn't. Um, I hope it does, but you know that's kind of that's for people in higher pay grades than me to decide. <laughs> but yeah, I'd be very surprised if it didn't, and would hope it did. Would yes. Yeah. yeah there's, there's, you know, the, lo- the novel, as we said, the novel gives you so many extra layers that you can go down into, and where you, you are the god of the storytelling in that one. So yeah, I suspect we might, but who knows? Who knows? And will you be playing the game? And if you will, what faction will you be playing? <laughs> yeah, I think I might need to upspec my computer by the time it comes out. Uh, if I'm playing it, well, my my obvious choice up front would be uh, the Ultramarines. You know, no surprises there, perhaps. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I think the, the anarchic part of me is quite fancying orcs because I've I've never fancied them in the tabletop. I mean, I love the orcs as an army, but the thought of painting an orc army has always given me the, the fear. So that, the idea that I can actually do the orc, actually play orcs, but not have to paint an entire army of them is, is sounding quite appealing too. Mm. Um, and someone did ask that they wanted to know from a writer's perspective how you and Anthony Reynolds will kind of ensure in terms of the, the, the storyline and um, like the short stories how you will keep the overall Warhammer 40k universe feel to the game um, because they still want, I think one of the things that a lot of people are worrying about is they still want that kind of grim dark atmosphere um, and Anyone who's read any of my books and Anthony's books as well will know that you know grim dark is wired into our DNA practically so there's no problem with that I mean, they should, nobody should be worried about that because one of the you know, one of the the roles, artificial or you know, the way that we have is is kind of being those sort of IP champions as well as as such as you know we're you know we're the ones who are writing a lot of the story in the background. So you know, we t- he and I, and Anthony and I, both worked in the design studio for you know six seven years apiece, and I've I've been involved with Workshop for the last fourteen years, so. I'm, I'm fairly fluent in you know the the grim dark mm. of the far future, and then, and you know the guys at licensing at GW itself. I mean, everything that we do will swing past their filters, and if it's not you know appropriate to the universe in terms of its flavour, whether it's a bit too light and fluffy and pink bunnies or too much horrible murder death, then those guys are the ones that will say you know lighten up or you know more grim dark, more grim dark. But no, I, you know this as one thing I'm I'm keen to reiterate is that you know I'm I'm a fan of 40k I have been all my days practically. The last thing I want to do is write anything that is not in keeping mm. with 40k because what would be the point of that? You know why would why would I want to write and play something that is the thing that I love and not make it the thing that I love? Yeah. So I think they can rest rest easy on that front certainly. And uh, someone did want to know what your favourite uh, 40k weapon is. Just for the sheer horribleness of it, I think the multi melter. Is <laughs> that you? Know, you point it, and then there's a buzz of microwaves, and then bang, you explode. And, and it's awesome. Do we have? Uh, we we also have dark angels or space wolves. Oh, I don't know. Dark angels were they were they were my they were my first army that I ever collected. Uh, but then having done Thousand Suns and then Pro- and read Prosper Burns and the Dan, the two two has worked pretty closely in those two. As much as I love the rules, I don't think I can forgive them for that. Um, and finally, um, it's no doubt that a question that you get asked all the time, um, but what advice would you give um, to members of the community who are aspiring writers and especially specifically looking to write 40k material? Uh, well, the first advice you give to any writer is read lots. Read a lot of the the genre you're going to be trying to write and learn its IP inside out, then read something else, read everything else, you know, read widely and read well, uh, then write a lot. I mean, I, I speak to hundreds of people at events who tell me that they've written stories or they're writing stories and how they've got 10 things written and but none of them are finished and I always keep flitting and I get a better idea then I move on to another story and then etc etc and you know I'll first thing I always say to them is well then that's useless 
you know, nobody wants to read 10 unfinished stories. Take one of those stories and finish it. Mm. You know, that's, that's what a writer does. He starts something and he finishes it or she finishes it. So until you finish the story, it's useless. You know, there's, you know, once you've got something on the page, no matter how rubbish it is at first, you can hone it, you can fine tune it, you can polish it, you can get feedback on it and you can make it better. If you've got a half finished story that not on the table and not on the page or you've got a great idea that you've never put to paper, so what? It's useless. Mm. Go away. So finish something if you start it, read a lot and write a lot and get lots of good feedback on it. Brilliant. Well, Graham, thank you very much for joining us. Um, no yep. doubt we'll be speaking again close to launch. I'm sure we will. I'm sure we might. When more stories are out. Um, so thanks very much. No, you're welcome. Brilliant. Cheers. Thanks.